The UFO UAP phenomenon is about as murky as it gets. With over 70 years of reports regarding the matter, we still haven't identified the unidentified. From the days of Donald Menzel and J.L. and Hynek to today, the picture of just what exactly this represents is still unknown. But then comes the question of should we study it? Should science take a look at it and see if actionable data can be obtained and the mystery, one way or another, might be solved? And apply rigorous scientific effort to finally determine what, if anything, it is. This question has recently taken a somewhat dark turn. My guest today is studying two aspects of the phenomenon that might actually be fully scientifically testable. And one aspect is disturbing. The first are recovered materials reportedly of UFO UAP origin, some first studied by Dr. Jacques Vallée. The second are reported injuries due to exposure to UFOs UAP that people have had. It's at that point that whatever this is becomes difficult to ignore and that some kind of investigation in science is sorely needed. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Gary Nolan. Dr. Nolan is the Ratchford and Carlota A. Harris Professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford University School of Medicine. He has published over 300 research articles and is a holder of 40 U.S. patents and has been honored as one of the top 25 inventors at Stanford University. His area of research includes hematopoiesis, cancer and leukemia, autoimmunity and inflammation, and computational approaches for network and systems immunology. Dr. Nolan's efforts are to enable a deeper understanding not only of normal immune function, trauma, pathogen infection, and other inflammatory events. Remember to subscribe to Event Horizon so you never miss an episode. Dr. Gary Nolan, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Now, doctor, you work in genetics, and one of my interest areas is in abiogenesis. How did we get life in the universe started? From your point of view, do you think that abiogenesis is something that's very rare, very hard, or do you think it's just repeatable organic chemistry that happens throughout the universe? Well, I can't see really a reason why it's not. I mean, if it can happen in one place, I mean, that's already in a Bayesian inference mathematics viewpoint, uh, it's basically a prior. It basically proves that it can happen. So the fact that it happened here with pieces of chemicals that we now find strewn throughout the entire universe, at least in terms of mass spectrometry and other things that we, where we can see things at a distance. And in meteorites, the evidence is pretty clear that complex molecules are already there. And uh, so I have, I have no problem with it. I mean, there's plenty of evidence that basically lays a path for showing that it if anything, what we are came from elsewhere. In other words, the building blocks of life are present and pervading the universe, yeah. or at least this galaxy. Well, I, you know, I, I can't see there's anything special about this galaxy compared to the many others. No, but I, I think there's also, I mean, we can talk about it later as we get into the discussion, but there's, there's at least mathematical evidence that suggests uh, that life might have actually started elsewhere and came here. And it's a, it's a variation of Moore's law of complexity. There's a Moore's law of, let's say, genomic or genetic complexity that if you extrapolate backwards, suggests even that the life here might have happened as many as 10, started 10 billion years ago and traveled here, if you will, through some kind of panspermia. Now that's, a, that's older than the solar system. So that, that means that, that life here could have origins in another star system itself. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, all of the heavy metals, basically things above mass of about uh, 30 or 40 came from the heart of another star, right, of a star that exploded. So you have to think across those kinds of time frames that the heavier elements were forged really in the heart of a dying star. I think that's something right out of uh, Thor, the Marvel comics. And so those elements had to partake in an explosion 
and then a recondensation that ended up generating the metals around this star. We're a second or a third generation solar system. So by that premise alone, it came from probably hundreds, if not thousands of other solar systems. And that's just the, that's, those are just the atoms that make up the elements in the materials that both we are and that the civilization we created are made from. Carl Sagan, we are made of star stuff. Now, with this sort of idea of panspermia, actual life, say microbes, locked in a meteorite, deep inside of a meteorite, is there a limit on time and distance, in other words, for something like that to transfer? In other words, can a genetic code, an organism, sit dormant inside of a meteorite for millions of years that's, that, that would be required for transfer between? Um, well, I, I think the short answer is we've already seen it for tens of thousands of years on certain kinds of bacteria that have been, res and that have been resurrected out of icebergs, essentially, or deep under the the permafrost uh so and i'm not sure about the, the the exact numbers of how long it would take for something so let's say you had a planet that is in a solar system 10 or so light years away i mean we could run the numbers i don't have the time we don't have the time to do it at the moment but you know if, if you got if you had a a meteorite crash on that planet that ejected a piece of something that ended up in space from there. Does it take a million years or just a few tens of thousands of years to get from one place to another? You know, even with conventional speeds, I'm sure people have done the, the, uh, the run the numbers, but I, I don't see it as impossible, no. That's a fascinating idea. And that stars sneeze on each other and could even sneeze life on each other. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's interesting because that seems to me that that would dramatically increase the chances for life across the universe. The question is, is that if you're related to it, even if you're two star systems away, say the sun had a close encounter with another star in the past and they exchanged life, is it really an alien? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think the more interesting question is, I mean, we're, I, I think people have run the numbers and it's not, it's, it's certainly easy to understand that over even just a few million years you can you can spread things around an entire galaxy or even a groups of group of galaxies i think the primary or the principal point is well look it's it that means at the very least it's all based on dna which means there aren't altern there aren't necessarily alternative codes for how life is generated other than dna unless there's something we're missing that's already here, even on this planet. I just don't know. That gets into a shadow biosphere. If you don't know what you're looking for, you may not discover a second occurrence of microbial life, even even if it was here, that you, you just might not know. Right. Do you think we have any hope if such a thing exists, a shadow biosphere, with current methods of studying microbes, do you think we could ever run across it if there was a second abiogenesis on planet Earth? Uh, yes, and I've actually, although I, I, I don't mean to sound conspiratorial or anything. There's someone that I'm working with who has at least pictorial evidence of such a thing. That's and fascinating. So, you know, but before I get all excited about it, I'm actually buying for the guy uh, some instruments that he can use to uh, determine if it's actually real or not. I mean, it's, the, the picture evidence that I've seen is pretty compelling. So we'll see. I mean, because what, what, whatever it is, it isn't standard. So, you know, it might just be a mistake on his part, but we'll see. I mean, that's the, that's the reason why, I mean, so one of the reasons why I don't want to talk about it too deeply is because I don't like doing science by news release. And I'm sure this person doesn't want the entire planet making fun of him for something that might end up being a mistake and, and nor do I. So, you know, but I think it's, it's fun that if the, if the question and the evidence suggests that it's worth following up on, What's a few thousand dollars to to develop a you know perhaps a better understanding of it? Yeah, and it's it's a it's a high reward. <laughs> it's a uh -huh. high reward proposition because if you find a second abiogenesis of life on Earth, then you're going to get a Nobel Prize or something along those lines. Now, my question about that, though, a follow up question would be, if it ends up being a null result, would you still publish to let of everybody know? You know. Yeah. Yeah, because I think the reason why you do it is you publish it so that the, so that the next person coming along doesn't make the same mistake. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there there's there's no there's there's nothing wrong with saying, and you know, I did the same thing with Atacama, 
I did the same thing with uh, the so-called Star Child uh, Skull, where yeah, people had interesting ideas. It wasn't, it wasn't, let's say, out of this world to come to the conclusion that what you were looking at might not be from this world. And so you just publish a science paper on it. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that people weren't upset. Um, I can't help that. But as long as the results are repeatable, which they are, then you just say it is. I mean, the Atacama thing, uh, I mean, look, Stephen Greer wants to think that it is. He has claimed all kinds of things about me, fraud and all kinds of stuff, which you better watch what he's saying because he's, he knows he's wrong. And But if, if he wants to say otherwise, prove it. He claims that he has that he didn't give me all of what it was that he had. So he can go out and reprove it and prove that I'm wrong. I dare him. Go ahead. He won't because he knows that I'm right. So, I mean, those are the kinds of things that if you're, if you're going to make a statement, base it on evidence, not on your wishes. Special pleading. In other words, you come to a conclusion before you do all the work and you stick to that conclusion and you just, you end up with a non-truth. Right. Now, in those cases of Star Child and, and the Atacama, these were, to my view, birth defects, yeah. right? In other words, they were genetically mm -hmm. human and they were just in right. bad shape. And you had these convergent birth defects that produced a very weird result. Have you seen anything in the course of your career genetically, whether it's a microbe or a, a piece of tissue or something like that, that could have been of uh, non normal life. I mean, have you ever seen anything that that said this thing probably isn't from me? No, I, I, I've not. I have not seen anything. I mean, probably the closest thing that's made its way to TV that has any, let's say, a public recognition is the, the work of James Fox uh, and the, I don't know if I got the word, the pronunciation right, the Virginia incident uh, in his mo recent movie, yes. The Mo yes. Moment of Contact. I mean, I mean but th th that's not a piece of tissue or whatever that's somebody's drawing and so at this point i mean from the standards of what you would call evidence it's it's anecdote i mean it happens to be the same anecdote from three individuals so that is more compelling in a, an incident that apparently was in one way or another viewed by dozens if not a couple of hundred individual people is there evidence i i don't know i i've not i've not seen it in person and i you know i'm not sure anybody would ever let me see it in person even if it does exist so, but that's a, that's been the, the uh, subject of thousands of conspiracy discussions. So I'm, I, there's no reason for me to go there. I mean, I, I, I think the, the point that you're raising though is the most important one, which is there are, there are different standards of evidence for different people or different classes of individuals. And one class is not above another. Uh, for an individual who experienced it, the proof is more than enough, right? They experienced it. I mean, so I saw some, I saw things when I was a young boy. That is proof enough for me as a person. But proof for me as a scientist is the same as the language of science, which is something which is, I, I can hand that proof over to somebody else or tell them to point their telescope or their microscope in the same direction. And they will come to the same conclusion as, as I do. And that usually involves a piece of evidence which is transferable. And so at this point, there is no such thing that we can hand to another person publicly. Now, there are claims that this stuff exists behind people's closed doors. But again, that doesn't meet the standard of a scientist. For the world at large who have neither experienced it nor have any evidence in their hands, to the extent that they turn to scientists as the arbiters of some form of truth, the truth is not out there yet for people. And, and I think though that that's, the, that's, a, that's an important problem a lot of people don't understand is that those two standards of evidence are very distinct. And if we want to pra place our trust in the, the, the global experience that many people have seen such things, then fine, I, then, the, then the discussion is over. But if we're going to do it by the standards of science, then the discussion is not over. So it, it's up to individuals to decide, do you want to go by the truth as would be sufficient in a court of law? Or do you want to go by truth via science? And I happen to live in both worlds. And if I want to have this conversation with my scientist friends who, who use just those second set of rules, then we, we still have work to do.
I think there, that from anecdote, you can sort of glean certain interesting things that might lead you in the right direction to study it. For example, with the Virginia incident, there was a smell associated with whatever that was, and it seemed to be ammonia. So that brings up a question, well, can ammonia be a solvent for life? So in other words, can the chemistry of life exist in different chemical mediums like ammonia? I mean, I, see, I don't see a reason why not. I mean, it can be a form of life that prefers let's say not necessarily a salty ocean, but a salty ocean that has ammonia in it, or is more ammonia based. I mean, we, we know that there are microbes, for instance, that feed on hydrogen sulfide rather and use hydrogen sulfide. So, you know, maybe these, whatever those beings were in the, in the Brazilian case, whatever those things were, you know, just preferred an environment that had a little bit more ammonia and or hydrogen sulfide in it. Um, I mean, I found that perhaps the most compellingly interesting of the of the case of, of the, let's say, the evidence in that case, that not only was there apparently liquid in the craft itself that spilled onto the grass around the crash site, but that the beings, if you will, seemed to carry it with them or at least be imbued with it as if they were living in that environment. And I, I mean, that was just fascinating to me. And the soldier who is claimed to have died, alleged to have died because of his interaction with the, whatever it was, you know, they talk about it, that he died from an infection. Actually, I, I, I think he died from not an infection, but whatever the toxin was that was on the skin of the object that he touched. And it was kind of a, a there's a, a variety of different kinds of hyperimmune responses that could be against whatever that toxin was in the oil of the skin of the of the claimed and alleged can't we keep using these words being and he died from that not from an infection or or, or some combination of it that basically you get uh, the skin opening you know across broad swaths of your body because of a toxin and that just basically allows for infections to occur now that's an aspect of this that i don't think has been well discussed publicly until recent times is that whatever this is, whatever the phenomenon is, it has injured and killed people, which immediately to my mind means that we should study it in science and try to figure out exactly what happened. You've worked with some of these cases of people injured through encounters with UAP. Can you, can you elaborate on that a bit and tell us what, as a doctor, what you thought happened? So I Again, I'm trying to be I'm trying to be careful because people have run with what I not, not that you're going to, but people will take this and run with it in a way that is not my intent. But I don't think that there's at least very much obvious maliciousness in whatever it is that's happened. I think this is kind of an inadvertent on the part of people who supposedly got close to these craft which were emanating a field. You know, it's as bad as if you were to walk across the airfield at a military base and you get in the way of the exhaust plume of a jet, you get hurt. It wasn't, the pilot wasn't trying to hurt you, but you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so in these cases, I it is sort of a, a situation of, for these individuals, if anything, an, an inadvertent getting too close to something. Now, you would think that if you've got a high, on the other side of the equation of whatever it was that they were getting too close to that if this thing or the or the intelligences operating them were smart enough they'd know never to let any organic being get too close to them so that basically tells you perhaps something about whatever is on the other side there's sort of an, an inadvertent indifference to our presence so that kind of to me that tells you something even deeper about the phenomenon in, in general that this indifference is like, it tells you something about the difference in the mentality of whatever the non-human intelligence might be versus us. That if, if it doesn't necessarily care about us, then how do we reconcile that with other kinds of observations where it's running around looking at our nuclear facilities or in other situations such as the Zimbabwe Ariel case, it's telling us that oh, we're poisoning our planet. How do you reconcile these? We care about the ecosystem, but we don't care about whether we hurt you in the process of our doing whatever it is that we're doing. And I, I think that tells you something even deeper 
that, and I had this conversation with Jacques Vallée once, is it one thing or is it many things? And Jacques' answer to me was typically uh, Vallean, which was, well, it could be one thing pretending to be many things, right? That wants to send the message that it's, that it's many things, whereas it really is only one thing. You know, he thinks about it as this global system of influence, uh, that it's a system of systems, as he often calls it. And so that's sort of the, the meta behind the scenes. The individual cases that I worked on through basically primarily was uh, Kit Green, who brought most of the cases to me. You know, we, we now know that the majority of those cases can easily be explained by, well, uh, explained uh, as uh, Havana syndrome, Havana syndrome, however you want to pronounce it. That doesn't mean that we understand the Havana syndrome, but at least they are, are seen as a, a kind of international, interstate, uh, I don't know what the right word is, uh, some sort of spy versus spy event where basically somebody, some human agency, either a state agency or a non-state agency or non-state actors are using some kind of conventional energy weapon to hurt diplomatic core of the United States. So once we understood that, good 80 to 90% of the cases that I was involved with could be easily classified under that and handed over to somebody else's provenance. But it did leave a significant number of cases of individuals who had clearly come in contact with something that was not Havana and, you know, one could construe as being outside of the norm of human existence. Now, the evidence was, in those cases, both anecdotal. It was a story from one or more individuals, but it was also reproducible insofar as I could take the MRI the same a number of times from that individual and I'd get the same result. Now, the open question is, did it occur because of the interaction that they had? Was it acute or was it something else? I don't know because I don't have a camera to, to be there, but whatever did cause some of the damage in some of these individuals was clearly an outside agency. It didn't just, they weren't born with it. It happened one day, they were fine one day, they weren't fine the next. And they claimed that the only thing that was unusual was this interaction that they had. So that's the kind of evidence that I can personally work with to hand to another scientist and say, here, Here's the evidence. You can agree with me that the data is real. This is a big push that I have that I, rather than believing the conclusion, believe that the data is real. Believe the data is real. Now let's figure out what you tell me, other than what they claim happened to them, what might have caused this, right? So that's, so I'm, 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 I don't wanna get into arguments about the anecdote itself. I'm interested in the damage per se, or I'm interested in the material that I can obtain from either that individual or something that might have been left at the site where the event occurred, and I can analyze the material and so that I can hand. So those are the kinds of cases that I get interested in because the others will be argued about endlessly. And so it's just not, it, it's just not in my interest to argue with people about stories. There's historians that are like Richard Dolan who are far better at documenting these kinds of things and putting them in, in the various contexts. And if, if anything, putting them down for posterity and writing them down as soon as they've happened as much as anybody can for other people to argue about hundreds of years from now even. In regards to consistency between injuries, look at a brain scan and you see the same thing in multiple patients. So my question is, is does that damage resemble anything else, any other type of injury or is it unique? Is whatever is happening to these people unique to this phenomenon? I mean, certainly the sclerosis that I've seen, the basically the burning at the skin level on the outside looks like some sort of radiation damage. I mean, r radiation is not magic. Radiation is anything from just electromagnetic waves to light, right? You, I mean, or you can aim beams of microwaves at people and hurt them. If there wasn't that slightly see-through mesh on your microwave that is just the right size to prevent microwaves from coming out of your device, you'd get cooked too, all the way through. So there's nothing magic about a microwave weapon. There's nothing magic about a gamma ray weapon. 
I mean, people use radiation or other kinds of proton beams, et cetera, in cancer therapy. They're just more finely targeted at the cancer. So there's, there's no reason you can't turn any of those into some kind of a weapon, or if somehow they're a part of a propulsion device that some civilization has figured out, if you get close enough to them, you're going to get damage. And, and wherever that damage, wherever those radiations, if you will, are concentrated, the tissue will get more or less scarred because of it. And that's at least the evidence that, that I saw on the MRIs. So it, it was... The, the damage was reproducible, not within a given organ in a specific place in that organ. It was reproducible as to the type of damage, which is more or less a scarring, which is both cell death, uh, induced cell death, um, apoptosis or, or otherwise, and then infiltrating immune system damage where the, info, the immune system comes in and cleans up the mess or in some cases, as what I think is probably happened to that soldier in the, in the Virginia case, it was basically a, a post, it's a toxic chemical of some sort that, was react, that caused the immune system to act upon it in, in, an over, uh, in an overwhelming case. Now, let me ask you this, this is sort of an off the wall question, but have you seen cases of these types of injuries in people that may not have known that they had even come in contact with UFO or UAP. In other words, somebody's laying in bed sleeping, one flies over the roof and you get the same injury. I haven't, none of them were ever brought to my attention, but you know, it's, it's one of the reasons why, and I'm excited about this, that I know of a fair number of groups now that are organizing around collecting that kind of data, right? One of the things that uh, Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo and, and others have, have done, and, and we, we often leave Tom DeLong out of the conversation, but I think it's fair to say we wouldn't be here because of his efforts is that uh, people are, are now more willing to step forward. I've had the, the number of emails that I've gotten from pure scientists, doctors, psychiatrists, et cetera, who are now organizing behind the scenes to set up groups to study this stuff in a more scientific manner. Uh, will I think let people who've had these kinds of things happen to them come forward to be studied. I mean, you have to, uh, science is always a matter of collect everything that seems interesting, put it in a giant bucket, and then start categorizing. So are there people who had something fly over their house or come into their room or whatever, and then they had a damage and didn't even know it was happening to them? Probably, but how do you find them? If they won't, even in an anecdotal sense, tag it with a metadata that says this happened to me, it's just somebody who, who woke up one day and they had damage and the doctors, you know, no doctor would know what to do with it. It's just, okay, well, you're damaged. I'm sorry. I can treat your damage. I can't treat, I can't treat the cause of your damage or can't understand the cause of your damage. And that's, you know, that's, that's sort of a big question because there's a lot of that out there. I mean, you see Parkinson's patients and things like that, that maybe there was some environmental factor in the past, their past that might have contributed to developing mm -hmm. the disease, but you can't know just that. Know you just don't is. know what yeah. it was. Now, in regards to the physicality of the phenomenon, if it's producing electromagnetic radiation of whatever sort, that suggests a physical object that can be measured. Yes. If, if the object is, if, if somebody could ever get a hold of the object that's producing it, then yeah, we can. Apart from the supposed crashes that have occurred, the alleged crashes that have occurred, which were, as far as we can tell, quickly absconded with by whoever the government might be, there's very little one can do other than to say, well, they won't give it to us, so we can't study it. Well, that's 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 the big problem is that there does seem to be some kind of a cover up, <laughs> yeah. especially in regards to this. But I can also see why they would keep it completely secret. If you recover a piece of foreign alien technology, that gives you a huge advantage if you can figure out how it works. So yeah, I, I can and I can't. I mean, I think we're past the point at this point of whether or not people will be able to accept it or not. I don't understand what the advantage can or cannot be if they've had 90 years or 80 years to figure it out and they still haven't done so. I mean, what are we worried about? Unless the technological advantage is so easy to make once you have it, that putting it in, in anybody's hands would be dangerous. I mean, if we all had the ability to 
blow up this corner of the continental shelf, then maybe that's a bad thing, right? I mean, maybe, I mean, just look at it this way. If, if, if anti-gravity were so easy that anybody could have the ability to travel out to the asteroid belt and push a rock our way, there's any of a number of crazies who might go ahead and do it and, uh, and cause bedlam. So from that standpoint, maybe that's a simple reason that you just don't want to give people free energy or the ability to run around and push rocks this way and that until we have a defense mechanism that stops people from doing it. And so if the defense mechanism don't, is don't give them the, the ability to do it in the first place, then that's where you got to go. And I would be perfectly understandable to that. I think the, the, the thing that bothers me, though, about it is if I were a government and I had rivals, as the U.S. government does, it might be advantageous to spread disinformation so that your rivals think you have superior alien technology, therefore don't mess with them. Well, yeah, there's the faints within faints within faints argument. And again, I uh, this this goes down the, the crazy road where it's, it's, it's never ending arguments. And so I'm just going to stay in my wheelhouse, which is you know, I'm going to stay as close to the street light on a dark night as I can with a flashlight and kind of look out a little further. But I'm not going to worry too much about the bugaboos that might be sitting just well outside of the light range. And so if if something comes if something comes into my hands that I can study and put the proof out, then we'll extend our knowledge base a little bit further. I mean, you know, look, if if, if the government wants I, I think, well, I think there's a different way to 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 say it. It's, I think that it would behoove the governments in a different way to say, look, this actually does exist and it is happening. Now let's come up with a framework for how to deal with the potential of what the technologies can provide, right? So how do we not worry about what can be done with this information and keep it secret because we're worried about that? And why don't we just say, well, this is what can be done. And now let's come up with frameworks for how to deal with that potential and protect ourselves against the danger of it. I mean, we, we all knew the danger of nuclear weapons, and we understood the, the value of using nuclear energy to produce you know, energy for civilization. And we, we went ahead, at least with the good side of it, even though we knew that the bad side of it was that we would be potentially giving the ability for, let's say, certain rogue regimes like North Korea, the ability to turn that into nuclear weapons. So as a society, I think that's a conversation that should be had. And, and I'm actually working with now a number of individuals to basically set up, let's say, organizations that can start to talk about this kind of thing in a productive manner. But frankly, all in the, in the absence of the kind of hard evidence that I think is, is necessary to prove to scientists to say that, well, look, I don't have to wait for the hard evidence to say that if it exists, what could be done with it? And how do we protect ourselves from the dangers of economic disruption or societal disruption? What are the, the more academic discussions that could be had around this, the solutions? Because I don't want to get, I don't want to spend my time under the covers or in the closet hiding from a potential danger. I always like to say that, okay, well, there's a, there's a potential utility for humanity here. Let's have that discussion. I mean, and, and I think the perfect example of this is the Alcubierre Drive, which is, I think, one of the first public discussions of something that Hal Putoff had long ago postulated, that there's a way to rework Einstein's equations to invert, basically, them that allows you to say, hey, look, we could travel faster than light. And this is now, because somebody dared to say, well, maybe you can travel faster than light, and maybe that's how it is that these things got here in the first place, that now is a whole sub-industry in standard physics to say, okay, well, let's see if this is practical in any way. And so the first equations around the Alcubierre drive basically said you had to convert the entire rest mass of the sun into energy to be able to create the, the, the negative energy to get to move faster than light. And then people have come up with various other ways to look at the equations and have brought those energy levels down by orders of magnitude. Maybe someday people will get it for, far enough down that they'll be able to do it properly. So that I see is a positive way to look at these observations and even as a thought experiment 
come up with potential positive utilities. But now, if you can gain access to that kind of energy, as a for instance, well, why would you use it necessarily to go to the next star? Why don't we use it to reduce energy costs and get ourselves off of oil and solve a lot of other problems thereby? So I, I always try to look at the practical positive side of things, if, 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 if only because it can get you out of a, you know, the doom scrolling uh, effect of, uh, and the depression that could come from only thinking of the negatives. It doesn't mean you ignore the negatives, but it also means you don't focus on them, at least in my mind. I actually interviewed Dr. Miguel Alcubier on this channel. For anybody interested, you should go and check out the backlog. But let me ask you this. Without FTL, say that we can't do it and that the rule of the speed of light holds true and fast. So there is a physical way for an alien civilization to have a presence here without FTL, and that is the von Neumann probe. Right. In other words, somebody, some star passed close by or somebody decided to colonize the galaxy with exponentially reproducing probes that could function as 3D printers and print out atmospheric probes in star systems with interesting planets like Earth and have a presence here. Because if somebody saw that printed out uh, probe, there's your UFO of alien origin. Now, let me ask you this, and it's a complex question. Could such a thing, and will there come a time where we can print out an organism? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny you say that. I can't talk about it publicly yet, but I'm involved in a project that will make itself known for basically doing exactly that. We can do it. I mean, it's primitive right now, but there's no reason we can't make our own self-replicating probes even just, just to explore the local solar system. I mean, why not make something that we send out to the Oort cloud right or to the to the uh the asteroid belt that starts building things for us so that we don't have to go there and build it it's just it's ready to go people have talked about that on mars there's absolutely no reason both from a mechanical point of view but also there's no reason we can't encode within synthetically created organisms the ability to terraform or build an ecosystem for us elsewhere so that you know and 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 these have been both you know, the part, both the piece of, of science fiction stories and science fiction movies that we do exactly that. I mean, science fiction doesn't mean fantasy that can't exist. Usually science fiction, it, the best science fiction is written with a, enough of a kernel of truth that people can believe it is that it's possible that it would happen. So, you know, I think we're well within the capability of beginning that today. So say we do that, that opens up the possibility of colonizing space with altered humans, humans genetically tailored to better live in an O'Neill cylinder or on Mars right. or something like that. And that we won't actually, as natural humans, we won't actually be the ones that, that explore space all that much. It'll be humans tailored genetically for the task. Do you see that in the future? And, and how far off are we? Well, I think we're, I, I, I mean, I think we're, closer in one sense than we expect, but further away in another. And I'll elaborate. I mean, closer in that we can do it, but we're going to make lots of mistakes in the process. I mean, so just look, for instance, at how intimately tied humans are to our environment. We're finding day by day, literally week by week in, in science journals being published about how intimately tied we are to our microbiota in our bodies. Microbiota affect your health, your response to drugs, you know, whether or not you're going to respond better or not to cancer immunotherapy. We find out that certain microbiota affect your mental health and can either make you more or less likely to be depressed. Not that you were genetically born one way or the other, but the microbiota create some sort of toxins or other things in your body that are or are not necessary for your for your health. So creating a human that lives in a certain environment is also, we also, also have to create the microbiota environment that that human requires that might not necessarily like living in that other place. So you've got to not only engineer the person, you've got to engineer the ecosystem that lives on and within that individual so that it also can provide the necessary context for the human to live a healthy life. We're so used to, as scientists, thinking we can take the human out of the, of the environment, the water in which they live, and just place them somewhere else and they'll be just fine. They won't. 
and we know that now and that's a fact and so i mean just look at what's happened to the astronauts we've put into low grav space i mean they have all kinds of problems with water differential across their bodies that give them sight problems right they can't see well they etc cetera, etc cetera. now if they had been born in space and grew up in space would they be okay i don't know but there's there's enough worries in what we already know now about what we need to bring with us to wherever we're going that we might have to engineer that alongside the humans and i just don't we, we're not there yet we're just not there so i think we just have to be a little bit careful about how fast we move but I, you know but I, I say that and i think humans will do it they'll make the mistake and then they'll say okay well before we take another step we we better do x y and z to recontext and engineer our ecosystem at the same time but we're just not there yet in my opinion now do you think that developing this sort of stuff will come as a natural result of medical science meaning that okay yes. so we're trying to we're trying to cure various forms of cancer and we we come across this idea that might be applicable to space do you think that's how that's going oh, yeah. to unfold yeah i mean I, I and i think artificial intelligence is going to help us. I mean, I, I was at a couple of meetings this week for the cancer work that I do and these kind of cancer moonshot programs where there are a lot of other called mainstream scientists, but leading edge thinkers talking about exactly this, that, that frankly, the human brain is not built to deal with the complexity of how the human brain even was or is constructed and the, how the ecosystems in the bodies all operate. But the good thing is that AI is coming to the table to help us, to help us understand these things. So I, I think the difference is, can, can we use the AI in a way that we understand how the AI is doing it? Or will the AI just be there to implement our wishes, even if we don't understand how it is that it's doing it? Does that make sense? It does. So, I mean, just like it, look, just look at AI art as an example. You can now just basically say, you can type in a prompt as to what it is that you want and the AI goes out and it uses the data from the pictures on the internet and it can create a, a picture that represents in some way the words that you've stated. I mean, it's just remarkable. People, artists are going crazy, both positive and negatively about it. As you can imagine, people are seeing their careers potentially destroyed, but the better ones are looking at it and saying, well, how can I use this as a tool in my palette, as a brush in my palette? And I think the same thing is coming for exactly the question you asked about medical interventions. Can I collect enough data that an AI can make the associations and not understand from a sentient point of view, but can say, hey, look, if you define for me the objective, I can look at the raw data and how the systems are currently organized and suggest to you how to reorganize them to create the following objective. I think that's coming. So I, I don't think I, I don't think humans will understand how to do it but we will create the tools that will enable us to do it. Now, that opens up a whole other series of ethical questions of, well, if you could do it, do you have the right to make the mistakes on behalf of the people you're going to be synthetically creating, if you will, to, you know, are, are you doing something to them that you don't have the right to do. It's sort of the same situation in the same boat as cloning. Do you have the right yeah. to, you know? And that, and that case in in China, where actually it was a, 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 a Stan, another sci Stanford scientist who I know, and it wasn't his fault that his former postdoc went ahead and did it, but because he was in communication with the guy at the time he was doing it, people tried to blame him. It wasn't his fault. But this guy in China claimed to have done it and inserted a gene in, a, in an individual. And it was a worldwide controversy. And he was not the Stanford scientist. He Again, he didn't do anything wrong in my view. He just had a conversation with the person. It was the other person who, who made a choice for a child that that child wasn't, didn't partake in. I, I think there's a lot, I'm not saying one should or shouldn't do it. It's just, you, you better know what the benefits, the ups and downs are before you try. But 
the, the other point is that once you once you start down that path and you open the door, it, it's the the positive attributes of what can happen will be lost amongst the few Frankensteinian mistakes that will get made. Yes, Frankenstein, and we live in a world where that's going to become an increasingly relevant story, despite it being over 200 right. years old at this point. Now, another aspect of this, you mentioned AI and working with AI. Does AI scare you in, in the sense that, could it be, could it be, and we'll, this is getting back into the work of Jacques Vallée, that the Kabuki theater, as he terms it, are masks of the same phenomenon appearing in different ways. Do you think ultimately it could be an alien AI, again, the von Neumann probe, an alien AI that we simply don't comprehend it because its motives and thoughts and thinking process are so different? Have you ever seen anything in AI that led you to believe that maybe AI will think differently? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, so first of all, I mean, I've said this both in the Lex Fridman interview and, and also at length in the interview I did with Tucker Carlson, is that what intelligence in its right mind, <laughs> to the extent, uh, would put itself in danger of interaction with a primitive civilization like us, relatively speaking. I mean, we're primitive. I mean, we're, we're, we're not only barely out of the caves, we're, we're close to putting ourselves back in them, you know, from, from some kind of global catastrophe mistake that we initiate. So why would you put yourself at danger of interaction? Why wouldn't you put some kind of avatar in between yourself and, as I've often called us, the angry monkeys? And so you wouldn't in your right mind. And so I think that I, I'm 100% sure that even in the case of the Virginia event, that whatever that was is some kind of avatar. And it wasn't actually the object that it, it, it wasn't actually it, it was a thinking, co perhaps conscious object, but it isn't what's actually behind the scenes. That's just a guess. I have no proof. I don't have... I, I, I don't get I don't get a weekly email from the Illuminati that tell me these things. I'm not an insider in any grand sense of the of the word. It just right now it makes sense with the data. It's a possibility. New data will maybe change my mind on it. But I, I have I have in fact, if anything, it's the most likely that there is some kind of artificial intelligence that is driving everything we're seeing. Whether or not it could get here by light speed or not, or better than light, why would you bother dealing with something as primitive as, as, as us? Well, I, I can think of one way is that the life in the galaxy is semi-rare and they have a motive to preserve it whenever they can. In other words, they see another occurrence of life and they come mm -hmm. here as scientists and they're like, well, we got to keep this species going. Oh, yeah. In no, which I, case? I, I have no problem with that, but I, I just wouldn't I just wouldn't myself step into the middle of it. But maybe you would. I, I don't know. I mean, we we send scientists out to nature preserves and they personally get involved. So maybe that's what we're seeing here. It could be. I mean, we have specialist scientists that can tell you everything you want to know about ants. So they're, they're maybe they're specialists, anthropologists or something like that, or an alien equivalent of an anthropologist that's just here to study us, but also perhaps act as a police force. Right. You can sit on your porch. You can sit on your porch for a day and you can see oh, two, three, four, five police cars pass by. Mm -hmm. They never stop unless you're actually doing something that yeah. <laughs> illegal. So maybe it's a police action scenario where they're looking at our nukes and things like that. And they're like, we're only going to intervene if they yeah. start to use these if things, you know, on an issue. Yeah. I mean, I've used yeah. that example of that, you know, maybe they didn't bother with us too much because throwing rocks and spears at them can be easily dealt with. But a nuclear explosion is enough that it might that their that their ships are not nuclear explosion proof and that we've gotten to a level of sophistication where we can harm them and if we're about ready to even move out into our own solar system even by conventional sublight means and if they've been around for millions of years they can say okay well we can project ahead 10,000 years and see them at alpha centauri or tau ceti or you name it in the near future and the bigger they get, the, the harder it is for us to 
turn them in a different direction without a global eradication event. Well, that gives you that gives you a motive ultimately, though, for them to be here is to monitor to make sure we don't create a technology such as a generalized artificial intelligence or gray goo or whatever right. what have you. Right. And that could pose a threat to the rest of the galaxy. And that's their sole purpose to be here is just to make sure we don't make something that can mess their right. day up. Right. There's a great science fiction writer by the name of Ian Banks, and he writes some beautiful stuff. It's a it's a fantasy future, hundreds of thousands of years into our future, where he touches upon this, where basically it is an AI sentience, which considers that humanity created, but it basically has created a kindergarten for humanity so that they can run around and continue to, to pursue their their more carnal pleasures, if you will. And but it's it's busy monitoring and keeping the whole galaxy in balance. So yeah, you're right. Maybe it's something like that. I would just recommend anybody who wants to read a good series of books, Ian Banks does it in a very tongue in cheek and intelligent way. Excellent books. I've, I've read several. Now. Attention, there will be a general meeting in one half hour. Materials. Now, there are these reports from Jacques Vallée and others, Linda Moulton Howe and To the Stars Academy, all of these about recovered materials that might be strange, mm -hmm. isotopically strange. And you have worked with such materials. Mm -hmm. Giving me a profile of what these UAP UFO related materials are like. So I've worked with three materials that I find interesting, Three, let's say three classes. I mean, one of the most interesting was the Ubatuba event, again in Brazil, with something which was at the time claimed to be pure magnesium. It's not pure magnesium, but it has more, it, but it is unusually pure and a kind of a crystalline metal. And what I found interesting about it was that in one of the fragments that I had, but not all of them, which is really what kind of makes my head spin was the magnesium isotope ratios were so far off what you would expect from magnesium you dig out of the ground that to basically say it was engineered, right? You can imagine maybe it came from another solar system somewhere else, but you'd have to imagine a solar nucleosynthesis cycle that is off of what we consider to be normal. It, to me, at the very least, it would say it was engineered, right? And the fact that I have material supposedly from the same event, some of which has normal ratios versus some that has altered ratios, I, I don't know. I, I can come up with ways to explain it, but the only explanations are that it was involved in some industrial process that produced the altered ratios from Earth normal ratios, if that makes sense. So let's say it was used for the let's say it was used for energy generation or the propulsion. They start with material that was used on Earth and in the process of using it, it got converted to these other ratios. How it happens, I don't know, but the, the, the only evidence I have is that it truly exists. And so, but I don't understand what it, what it means. And is it, is it proof of aliens? Is it proof that something unusual happened? Yes. Is it reproducible? Yes. So again, it's it's back to that thing of data, not conclusions, because there's so many potential conclusions. If you leap to any one of them and you're proven to be wrong in any one of those absolute conclusions, you just made a fool of yourself. So, but the, I think the, the problem that a lot of, and this is just to go again off on a slightly different bent, is that a lot of lay public or the skeptics who want to bring down any discussion of this is they will take any postulate or hypothesis you make, they'll turn it into a conclusion and they'll ridicule you for even coming up with the, the, the question in the first place, as if you had made the conclusion that is embedded in your question. And so that's why I'm always trying to be very careful how I say things. And I mean, people are going to take me out of context no matter what, because that's their, their goal in life. Jason Calavito is probably the, the, the most ridiculous at it loves to take things that people say and then and recontext them and make fun of them and it's just it's just it, it's it's intellectual vandalism of the highest order so i, I don't want to really give people like that too much meat for their grinder but i think the 
the main point is that you can that's that's one of those kinds of materials which, which has some very interesting stories around it then the other one are these events that i've got a few examples of now of where a craft is seen and something is ejected from the craft and when people kind of go and find what it was that it was ejected, it ends up being like pools of molten metal on the ground. And I've got three cases of, of this, and there's many cases like this that are, that are out there. So that's a class of events that, okay, well, let's study what that metal is. Okay, so now you can say, well, is, is that another example of a, of a propulsion system or an energy generation or God knows what. I mean, those are the only two simple things. I mean, for, for all we know, it's how they process their waste matter. I, I don't know. But we can look at that stuff. And I, we published, Jacques and I, and a couple of others, actually a former postdoc of mine now at Harvard. He has his own lab now in Harvard Medical School. We published a paper examining one of those materials where we basically showed that the material is, I mean, it's conventional metals. There was nothing unusual about the isotope ratios, but each place where we looked in the metal, the elements that were there were slightly different. And they were all the same metals, but they were there in different ratios, meaning it was inhomogeneous, meaning that six different elements, metals, titanium, iron, a couple of others, chromium, were there, but they were incompletely mixed. Okay, so what conventional process do humans ever use that don't fully mix what it is that they're making? Very few. I mean, we don't make inhomogeneous things because that would end up being, from a tensile strength point of view, it would basically mean something would fracture in unexpected ways if you were trying to use it for any structural purposes. So let's make the leap of assumption that it came from some kind of craft. What industrial process would they use that would lead to something which was inhomogeneous? And maybe the very fact that it was inhomogeneous, whatever the process was that they were using, led them to say, oh, we got to get rid of this. It's not doing what we want it to do. Let's throw it away. Defective or waste, essentially. Defective or waste. And what's interesting is a couple of the cases that I know of, the objects that were seen ejecting these materials seemed to be in some kind of distress. They were wobbling or they weren't acting. I don't know how these, I don't know how you could say the, how these things act normally. They, they weren't acting, at, at least to the precipient, they s- seemed to be something wrong with them. They eject this stuff and now everything's better and they, they zip off. Is that telling us something? Or were they doing it for us to tell us something? You know, you, ha- you, you got to play those kinds of those games. So, I mean, Jacques Vallée tells me a, a story of, of an intelligence officer that was talking to him at one point in the, that, look, when a, when a scientist gets 95% of the answer, they think they've got the answer and they don't care about the other 5%. And when an intelligence agency, meaning like a government intelligence agency, gets 95% of the answer, they assume that it's been given to us to distract us we're interested in the five we're way more interested in the five percent that we don't know so i worry that many of the things that we see and we think we're observing these objectively are actually being again from the kabuki theater point of view are actually being presented to us to lead us to think a certain way about something and so i'm just trying to be careful what my assumptions are about the data that we're collecting in the first place and I think you have to be. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I do that every day in my in the in the J job, in that I'll I get data, and I'm assuming I'm collecting the data that I think I'm collecting, but it might be that the manner in which I'm collecting it is biasing the answer in the first place. And so, when you're trained properly in the sciences, you always keep that in the back of your mind, that I I might have been biased in how I'm collecting this data. So anyway. So that's the second one. So the second class of materials are these supposed ejecta. I mean, it's clear these things are not meteorites and they're not somebody. There's plenty of stuff that I've been given that is clearly a hoax or was hoaxed for the individual who thought they were seeing something. But this is, as far as we can tell, not 
hoaxes. And then the third one that has been talked about quite a bit are these so-called the, the so-called meta material that originally came, I think, into Linda Moulton Howe's possession, but also the possession of other individuals. This layered magnesium bismuth material. Arts parts. Um, arts parts, yeah. Which, you know, is still intriguing. And I have several examples of it myself that have come to me. It's been broken up to many pieces, was handed to X, Y, or Z, and then people have handed them to me. I know that there is a very large chunk of it that is currently in government possession through uh, TTSA. And the, the analyses that I have seen of the material, even done by the government, leave much to be desired. I, I'm frankly shocked at how amateurish the data analysis has been. And it's sad because if, if that's the kind of analysis that's been done on the real parts that people have, somebody needs to up their game. And it's, um, it's just, it, 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 at least the data that I've seen is not, has not been done by somebody who really knows what they're doing. So what I'm doing with, that, with the pieces that I have is setting up basically a laboratory with the right kind of funding that can go from A to Z, comparing these things with the, all of the necessary tools that everything is put through pretty much the same path of analysis so that you can do an apples to apples, apples to oranges comparison and, and just do it right. I mean, it's not, it's not hard, but it is expensive. I mean, to set up a laboratory like this with all of the necessary materials, I mean, these instruments cost anywhere from a few hundred thousand to a few million, but there's a few dozen of these kinds of instruments that you need. So just from an instruments basis, you're talking about a 50 to $100 million investment. Now, luckily, there are forensic laboratories that exist which have this kind of stuff, right, that you can pay for. So at the beginning, at the very least, the money is required to put all of these materials through such an analytic pipeline that you can essentially buy off the shelf the, the, the services to do that. But buying the services and creating the data is not the same as analyzing the data. So now you need basically a reasonable team of five to 10 postdoctoral level individuals who understand what that data can mean. And so five to 10 people, we call them an FTE, uh, full-time equivalent. That's $200,000 each on average. That's the number we use in Silicon Valley for basically hiring that kind of training in various areas. So five to 10 people, that's another 2 million a year. So even just to analyze the data that might take a couple of million to generate, it's expensive. People say, oh, let's just do it. And, and then they send me stuff. Just writing that paper on the Council Bluffs material that, that Jacques had took me two years because I was doing it in my spare time. And I sort of, and I even said, I have renewed appreciation for my postdocs and the time and effort that they do. When, when I decide, when I change my mind on what it is that I want analyzed, I can do that in five seconds, but then I'm basically committing that postdoc to several days of work to reanalyze the data. So until someone is willing to put down the money in a sort of a charitable sense, or the government is willing to say, I'm going to put this together in a way, put the money to it. I mean, in, in, in the global sense of a, of a now $850 billion defense budget per year for the US alone, peanuts to do it. I'm not convinced it's been done with the materials that are sitting in people's warehouses. Maybe they don't feel that they need to, but I, I think if one of the things that I basically helped get put into the, into the defense appropriations budget around this matter, it's public record, is getting scientists, getting the DOD to admit that scientists should be brought in to at the very least help them design the analytic systems that are there because, you know, it does take a particular training to design a, a, a good experiment that is publishable and believable by other scientists. Anyway, so those are the things that I think. So the, the arts parts, I have looked at it. It is unusual for sure. It is irregular enough in the 
in how it was put together that I can still believe that it might be just the process of some conventional smelting and it has nothing to do with anything unusual. I can I can believe that because of the irregularity of at least the pieces that some of the pieces that I've seen. But then it was told to me that, well, this happened in a crash, so that's why it looks so irregular. It was kind of melted. That's why it's irregular. Okay, that's fine. You know, is it a waveguide is how put off puts forward. I mean, whether it is or not, the fact that it's layered in that way makes you think that it could be. So I have no problem with Hal's postulate there. But I did reproduce a minor discrepancy that somebody else noted in the magnesium ratios and the magnesium ratios do appear to be off. Now, there are potential conventional reasons why I can think the magnesium ratio is off because they're off so slightly as to be not an error of measurement, but an error of how the thing can be measured. And so I, so there's, there's a couple of irregularities about the arts parts that I think are interesting, couldn't be followed up on, but the level of analysis that has been done is insufficient at this point to come to any real conclusion. I mean, there's two things in science. I can analyze something and tell you what it, what it is from a, a material science. It's made of these atoms in this organization, but okay, that's fine. What's it used for? Now, if somebody can do something to arts parts and make it float on the table, and it floats on the table on the table because you irradiate it with some kind of terahertz wave and suddenly it, it weighs less or what have you. Well, fine, that'll convince me far more than uh, a theory. But I haven't seen any of that done. Neither have I. Yeah. I've just heard claims, but I have not seen floating metal. The Ubatuba... Sorry for that. Was a, that was a long discussion about it. I hope that was clear. That was perfectly but, clear. Now, the Ubatuba sample... That happened, that incident happened decades ago, and I guess the sample is provenance all the way back to that. Were we capable of duplicating that in those days, and how much would it have cost to hoax it? Um, it would have, I mean, yes, we were capable. To hoax it would have probably been in the hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. And why you would do it over a beach in you know Brazil, I can't fathom. It's... Uh, I mean, so the short answer is yes, you could do it, but there's no there's no physical reason why you would do it because we don't play with isotope ratios, except to blow stuff up. Yeah, right? Medical and, science and blowing stuff up is the, the only reason to do it, and that's all very, very expensive stuff. That's a very expensive thing to go throwing around and blowing up over a beach in, in Brazil. So... I mean, and, and, and that's the primary thing is that if, if we don't have a reason for doing it, why would you do it just to convince somebody 40 years in the future who's going to analyze it? It doesn't make any sense. But then again, there is a certain irrationality about this whole thing, about the behavior of these things. So mm -hmm. you, you just don't know. Maybe they're trying to influence us culturally, and that's the only way they know how is they can't exactly land on the White House lawn and, and, and shake hands with Biden because they don't know to do that because mm -hmm. we don't have a global centralized government or anything like that. Right. So maybe they're just doing what they understand, and they're hoping that we understand it or at least hoping to influence us to the point where we do understand it. I mean, even if it's not an influence campaign in, in any over – overwhelming sense of the word. Maybe they're just doing what they're doing. And if we happen to notice it, that's fine, but they don't care. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we do our business in the forest and I'm sure there are glimmers of intelligence in the, in the tarsiers, primates and crows and parrots who see us doing things, but we don't necessarily understand why we're doing them. And it, that's, that's the key. If you're dealing with a truly alien species, you can't assume that you can understand it or know anything right. about it. But you, what you can do is say, well, look, that thing crossed an enormous amount of space time. So it must have <laughs> some understanding of science and technology, maybe superior to our own. Right. Every time you anthropomorphize somebody or something else, you run the risks of, uh, of lost in translation. 
One last question about materials, and then I have a final question for you after that. But about materials, is it possible that the amateurish nature that you're seeing of the analysis done on these materials is because the really good analysis is done on really good materials the government has, such as a downed Roswell spacecraft or something like that, and that we just don't know about it, we're not privy to it? And as an aside, have you read the Wilson Davis memo? Do you think that that's a, a hoax or do you think there might be something there that suggests that the U.S. government has recovered materials that we don't know about? I mean, so in the in your first question is, yes, I just cannot imagine that if these materials were held in the early days by people who have talked about Heisenberg and, and others involved in the nuclear bomb creation who, who did partake in some of the initial analyses or knew about this stuff. I can't imagine that real analysis was not done on the materials now. But let's talk about the time frame where these things were originally collected and the infrastructure was set up around the, again, let's claim the, let's put forward the alleged suppression of information. Frankly, the technologies for, an, for analyzing materials was really not available at the time. Mass spectrometry was only becoming, there was only the glimmers of what we can do today with mass spectrometry in place. M metallurgy was mostly recipes, not analysis because we understood what we were necessarily doing, right? You would make this and it would do that. And then you had theories about why you would do X, Y, or Z. But the analytic procedures in the 40s and 50s just don't even come close to what we can accomplish today. I mean, we can get to near atomic resolution of any material. I think we're within about five angstrom resolution right now, and things that I'm involved with will get us into the sub angstrom realm. And so, uh, I mean, that's what we need, in my opinion. So, but so if you didn't have that capability, and now you set up an infrastructure of information suppression, that you can imagine information suppression approach has carried forward to today where everything was put under lock and key and anybody who wanted to get their hands on it to do it properly was basically told to go bugger off, as my sainted father would say. So it wouldn't surprise me if the kinds of analysis that could be done have not been done. And so that doesn't mean that that can't be done or that somebody hasn't been done. But if it has been done and, and hasn't been publicized to any significant degree within the communities that could appreciate what that information really means, then as far as I'm concerned, you haven't done it. And um, if you've locked it away in a, in a closet and it, if, if you if you don't put it in the, in the hands and the minds of people who can understand what can be done with it and it's sitting in the hands of a politician, it's as good as not being known in the first place. Very true. Yeah. And so it's down to the whole thing. If you don't understand the thing well enough to explain it to somebody else and you don't understand it, right? If you only understand the dangers of it, that's fine, but perhaps the, the dangers were misinterpreted. So you, we need to bring more minds to this. I'm not saying that scientists know better. I know plenty of scientists who are frankly idiots and I wouldn't trust anything with them. So, uh, you know, they would only have malevolent purposes to do with it. So I think that's why a certain level of transparency is is going to be better than not. And that was the first. So the first part of your question. So the se what was the second question? I think I was just wondering that that a uh, Boston Davis uh, memo. That do you think that there's anything there? Do you think that might just? Uh, I mean, be a... I, I, uh, I more than a hundred percent believe that Eric is reporting something that happened and a conversation that was had. Now, and I can all I, for all the right reasons understand why. Admiral Wilson would need to deny it. Now, the open question is whether they were talking about something which actually behind the scenes was happening. Admiral Davis could have been talking to Eric about something that he was told, but what he was told might have just been a disinformation campaign, right? Or somebody yeah. was lying to him. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I the, we can, and this is one of those things where we can argue endlessly about the, whether Eric is reporting what happened. I, I I just know Eric. He just he has no there's no profit in him lying about this. And I also know Eric in how his he has a, a, he's one of those truly unique individuals who has a an, an eidetic memory. 
he can recapitulate a memory in ways that I, if I could, God, I wish I could do it, what he can do. Remember a conversation practically word for word. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of talent that I, I wish we could, could share. But I mean, so the, the open question is, are they talking about something which really happened or is, is not, as I said, a disinformation campaign? So once you get into that kind of unknowingness, I basically have to lose interest because absent a camera or the ability to trace back the other discussions that were supposedly had by Admiral Wilson, we'll never know. I mean, it's, it's, it's useful and I'm glad that people are going to investigate it, but I'm not going to sit around and argue about it because, again, I'm just going to do the things that I know that I can do, which is I can study materials if somebody hands them to me. I can tell them how to study them if they want that information or how to do it. They can listen to me or not if they want. And then I can study the medical harms of people who said that certain things have happened to them. And I can report the data and people can look at the data. And the good thing about doing it that way is that once they get them to agree that the data is real, you can then say, well, look, stop asking me to come up with explanations for it. You have a brain, use it. You tell me what it is. And if you don't know what it is, then being an armchair critic is just, it, it, you know, it, it feels good, but it is ultimately a sterile approach to thinking and science and intellectualism. Now, my final question for you is about the stigma. And we all know it existed years ago. Dr. James E. McDonald wrote a paper, uh, Science in Default, and it's, it's a quasi paper. It was actually a presentation, that, and this was the text of it. And it was done in 1969, and it basically said, there's science here, we need to be looking into this phenomena. And then essentially, his career got ruined and his reputation got ruined and he uh, committed suicide just because of his interest in UFOs, which is about as innocuous of an interest as you could have, you know, mm -hmm. what's the big deal? So that stigma held the study back. But if you read that paper, it looks like it could have been written yesterday. The situation was the same back then as it is today regarding a stigma. So what do we do to destigmatize this? And I mean, do you just go with it and not care? I mean, as a scientist, how do you deal with the, the sort of, I think Stanton Friedman called them noisy negativists and people that say, well, there's nothing to this and that's that, when in fact there's enough out there now at this point to say that there's science to be done here? How do you deal with that? I, I, I honestly, I think you just go ahead and, and do it, but, but you do it in a credible way. I mean, people, and that's what I'm trying to teach people is that there's, there's, a, there's a rhetoric for how you talk about it. And that's at least my limited minor contribution is data, not conclusions. And then second, at least from a scientific point of view, don't focus on things that there's no answer to, right? Historical events, trying to argue the truthfulness of them with whatever data you have. The only thing you can do is get more data that proves your, your point. So I think the stigma is first that. And then second is, as I've been recently talking about, separating and making people understand what a cla that the classes of proof are different for different individuals. So don't, don't move one class of proof, provability from one domain into another. So you can't move anecdotal individual experiences into the domain of science because scientists talk a different language. You can say, I don't care to prove anything to scientists. That's perfectly legitimate. But don't expect a scientist to agree with you if that's their standard of proof. And so I, I but I think that the, the very fact, though, that credible individuals such as pilots and others have come forward, and even you just need to look at the social media lately, pilots, commercial pilots claiming what they've seen and talking about it now openly. I think the 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 walls have begun to crumble around the stigma where it's now more possible to talk about. I mean, I had a fundraising conversation. Well, I had started a fundraising talk about cancer in my work to a group of extremely wealthy families about six or so months ago. And they wanted me in half of that time to talk about my UFO stuff. And so I followed up with discussions with, with many of them, some of whom are interested in, in funding further research, 
cancer research and others are funding the inquiries into UFOs, this kind of policy work that I've been starting to talk about. Because th they find an individual who's credible in one field, science, mainstream cancer research, talking about this in a credible manner and Avi Loeb talking about his stuff in a credible manner. And there's few, I, I mean, I would, I would hate to get in an argument about science with Avi because he'll crush you. I mean, he's just so good at that kind of rhetorical question and quick on this feed that that's the kind of thing where we where we need to change the equation about the use of shame right shame has been used against people doing this and now i think enough scientists are coming forward and saying you know what it's actually shameful to not ask these questions so you know we can turn the tables on the critics by pointing out the styles of rhetoric that they're using and that are actually intellectually dishonest and say, look, look and, but it, it takes time to recognize what those, what those, let's say Machiavellian approaches are that people are using those and the intellectual sleights of hand that they use to say, look, that's actually, that, that you're, you're actually cheating by using that kind of an approach. It's, it's, it's fraudulent to approach the argument that way. And so if, if, we, if we can start to frame the argument in scientific terms, you can show how it's possible to talk about these things and that where it's okay to ask the question that, and that not asking the question is actually the dishonest approach. You can always argue, should we be talking about this versus child poverty? Or should we be putting money into this versus saving the rainforest? That that kind of false equivalency is is always in the in the wings, and the answer is is kind of a it's kind of a funny thing. A, a famous scientist once said, "Focus on everything." Focus on everything. And Dr. We are out of time. Thank you for appearing with us. And I very much look forward to results from both your work and the Galileo Project. And uh, let's try to figure this out in an open, honest way. Well, thank you so much for your questions. It was really fun. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. Gather round. It's time for the yearly budget. Oh, good. What am I going to lose this year? John, you are allocated the following. $13 per week for food and essentials. You are further allocated $3 per month for item Beard maintenance. End of allocation. Women, that's 50 cents more than last year. We've had a good year. End of allocation. Can't believe I gained 50 cents. Yes, John, 50 cents. End of allocation. Mr. Sprocket Davis, BAMSC, you are allocated the following. $14,324.19 for item. Discretionary fund. End of allocation. Wait a minute. First of all, the possum's name changes each week. So we just need to start calling him the possum from now on and not giving him a proper name. Number two, how is it that his funding is orders of magnitude more than mine? End of allocation, John. Look at the itemization of this funding that the possum's getting. $2,000 for pterodactyl resurrection. We really don't need pterodactyls, especially in this house. End of allocation. And then look at this, $400 for fur regeneration. I mean, granted, he's got a beautiful head of hair, but at some point, I don't have any. End of allocation, John. And what's completely missing out of this itemization is Anna's expenses and funding. Anna, come clean. How much are you spending on parts? Who exactly is paying the exorbitant $40 a month for internet access when I'm still on dial-up? 
And I don't even get to use that internet. I'm still on dial-up. End of allocation, John. And what about this electric bill? It looks like something in this house is using 10 times more energy than a normal air conditioner in midsummer. Is it some unholy experiment by the possum or is it you, Anna? End of allocation, John. Anna, look at this electric bill. How much electricity are you using per month these days? Anna, what's in the shed out back? Now, even more importantly, how did we get a shed out back? Look, look at it, look at it. The opossum has built a shed in the backyard and it has a sign on it. Beware of pterodactyl. And why, why is the building glowing? Wait a minute, I hear bagpipes. Anna, how is it that you can allocate $600 to the possum for Loch Ness monster observations? Look, is he going to go to Scotland and, stay, and just sit there looking for the Loch Ness monster? Or, wait a minute, he's bringing it here. 